I'd like to just mention a few things about Mr. Muteya. I'd like to share something. The very first celebration of Madras Day, was, which was promoted by him, took place in 1989. And everybody, it was at the Taj Koromandel, and everybody was asked to dress up in something in the seventh, of the 17th century, because that's where the British came, 1639. So most people came in Madhsars and nine yards and dhoti and all. I happen to have an old Afghan outfit. I don't know how my family got it with a full silver front and everything. And I wore it and it looks, it's completely a Mughal outfit. It's something from Central Asia. But unfortunately, my husband with his beard and that time it was black. He came with just a kurta and a churidar and a uh, embroidered cap. He looked more Mughal than I did. <laughs> so that's one thing. But he was very, Mr. Butya was very much against the renaming of Madras and wrote extensively against it. And for those of you here who are Mylaporeans like me, one thing you'd be very happy to know is that Mr. Butya said if Madras had to be renamed, it should have been Mylapur because this is the oldest part of the city. And he didn't like Chennai because Chengapa Nayakar never came to Madras. Leave alone, live here. And every year, he, he was the one who thought of Madras Day and who started the celebrations. I remember the first time he came to me with Abraham Irali and Vincent de Souza of uh, Mylapore times. And he uh, talked about it and he said, you must do something. So we put up an exhibition with our own uh, uh, catalog, with all our pictures that we had. And every year he'd call up about two, three weeks before and say, just in case I forgot, I think he didn't trust my memory too much and he wasn't wrong. He'd say, now what are you doing this year? So for his sake, I mean, I must tell you, I think all the celebrations, all the exhibitions, the British Library Collection, our own archival collection, Mr. Narayan Swami's collection, all these exhibitions that we uh, put up were all really for Mr. Muteya because he made it a point to call and say, what are you doing? So I had to produce something for him. So I think all of us miss him very much and I'm very happy that we are all celebrating his life and work today in this annual memorial lecture. And I would like to thank Colors of Glory Foundation for honoring me by inviting me to speak on this occasion. Thank you very much, sir. Um, the role of architects and native contractors is noteworthy. Now, I'm going to show you a lot of slides. I'm not going to describe all of them because then the lecture will go on forever. But I'll just uh, talk generally about a lot of them. So the earliest colonial building surviving in old Madras now, of course, Chennai is the Portuguese church built in 1516. The inscription on the foundation stone further reads that the friars, in honor of their safe, safe arrival in the harbor, built the church of Our Lady of Light or Luz Church. The high bell towers and detailed gateway and windows are typical of Portuguese churches and are a major theme of Portuguese colonial religious architecture of the 16th century. The style of this church includes Gothic style arches, but mainly Baroque, which you can see in the front elevation, on Baroque ornamentations which evolved during the period of medieval Christian art in France. Distinct characters of Gothic style are the pointed arches, and the ribbed wall, the buttresses, the flying buttresses, large windows which are often grouped, and so on. So they have ornate facades, which was a European style and which came here with the Portuguese. Of course, this is the entrance to St. Thomas Mount. Very little of the original is there now, and what there is is, of course, so covered by all the new buildings around it. And it's inscribed Madras J. George. So George was the one who did this painting. 
This was a church built in 1523 by the Portuguese and the church stands on top of the hill. At the northern foot of the mount is a gateway of four impressive arches surmounted by a cross bearing the inscribed date 1547. A flight of 160 steps leads up to the summit of the mount. Now, although the Portuguese were the first colonialists to come to Madras, this is all we have left of their architecture. So, at least we know that they left something behind. Then, of course, we come to the Dutch. And not many people realize that the Dutch were here before the British. They came to trade. But uh, they also built, again, the Gothic architectural style. In 1613, they established, they uh, built a fort at Saduranga Patnam, also known as Sadras, which was built for commercial purposes, with warehouses, granaries, stables, mansions and burial grounds inside this fort, but nothing of it remains. I've gone and looked for everything and nothing is there today. But the fort served as a fortified town, which was right on the beach. If you've been there, you'll know that it's right on the beach. It would have fulfilled their commercial activities. There were lots of pirates at this time, so forts were essential to give them protection. And according to the tomb plaques found inside the fort, we can approximately say that it may have been built between 16, 18 and 20. The huge fort walls made of lime mortar and brick were strong enough to face cannon balls. The bastions, ramparts and watchtowers are found in this fort complex and that's all that remains of the Dutch fort at Sadras. Now the Dutch cemetery in Pulikat is uh, what is left of the Pulikat Fort. Actually, the Pulikat Fort was originally built by the Portuguese who were displaced by the Dutch. Of course, this is all that remains, the cemetery. And I don't know whether you are aware that between 1621 and 1665, 131 slave ships were deployed by the Dutch to export 38,441 Indians captured on the Coromandel coast and transported from Pulikat to be sold as slaves in Dutch plantations in Batavia. Batavia is modern Jakarta. So our Indians were taken there to be sold as slaves. Pulikat was till 1690 the capital of Dutch Coromandel and it repeatedly changed possession from the Portuguese to the Dutch and so on, till it was finally taken over by the British. Then we come, of course, to the British, although the Portuguese and Dutch evolved colonial architecture in India, no major civil constructions came up in what is today's Madras. It was just these port, this fort on the port. Madras is really an early settlement of the British in India with numerous colonial buildings built over the centuries. Now the first construction of, Madras, of the British in Madras was the factory, as they called what was to become Fort St. George. It was on a piece of land they negotiated for the purpose of trade from the Raja of Chandragiri by Francis Day and this was on August 22nd, 1639, which is why we celebrate the day as Madras Day. Um, the construction of the fort was started in 1640, so it was soon after the British came. Initially, the British constructed a warehouse with accommodation facilities and later they fortified their township. The fort was completed in 1644, coinciding with St. George's Day, which is why it became Fort St. George. A local settlement also emerged near the fort, consisting of local merchants and laborers. So this is Fort St. George on the Coromandel Close coast. I got this 
painting from the British Library for my book, uh, Madras Then Chennai Now. And uh, the artist is Jan van Rijn, a Dutchman working in London. Also visible now, this is really more a conjecture of what Madras, the port, would have been like. Also visible are St. Thomas. St. Thomas uh, Mount, you cannot see from the port that he's put in everything. St. Mary's Church, the government house, other. He's packed them all into this building. Now inside Fort St. George, this is a watercolor by James Hunter. At the side, I've given the owners, name of the owners of these paintings. And the early buildings inside the fort were Georgian and constructed sometime after the plans of Benjamin Robbins, who was the man who reinforced the fort with walls and bastions so that it could withstand attack. And that was necessary because, as you know, the French and the British were constantly at war in this area. The beautiful Georgian buildings within the fort came up in the 1770s and 80s as part of a rebuilding program along with Robin's improvements. Many of the buildings inside the King's Barracks still stand and are excellent examples of Indo-European workmanship and material. Now you'll find one thing interesting that they all are flat roofed because at this time the Indians built a uh, sloping roof, uh, roof uh, you know, houses, but you'll find these are all flat roof. This is the original government house inside the fort, and the early buildings have a combination of Indian and European styles with Palladian style, style facades. Palladian style is a kind of triangle with uh, pillars looking very imposing, Roman, Greek, and uh, that was a very popular style. They had pillared verandas, Indian style, large windows, Romanesque frontages. But the traditional Tamilian houses continued to exist outside the fort in what was known as Black Town. And this was White Town. Very, uh, I mean, the name says it all. Now, the flat ceiling, there's a lot of uh, controversy because the British engineers claimed to have invented the Madras Terrace. But I do not agree with this because our museum in Kanchipuram, which is over 400 years old, nearly 450, we have a Madras Terrace over there. And that was long before the British came to India. So I definitely would say that the Madras Terrace is Indian. It's a traditional ceiling technique used for small spans, made of wood and archical or kandikal, which is a small brick. Thick teak wood beams were placed on the wall, which supported wooden rafters that ran along the shorter side of the room. In fact, our old building over here, the main building, has uh, um, a madras terraces all over. The gaps between the rafters were filled with kandikal brick and they were laid across in a diagonal fashion, stuck together with lime paste to create a sheet of bricks over the frame of rafters. A three-layer diagonal brick course was laid with each layer in an alternate direction. So you can see the tremendous science that went into it. You know, instead of my just reading it out, uh, you can imagine, because this was a time when you didn't have RCC, and the Indian craftsmen, the Indian uh, contractor and uh, men who were building it really put their mind and created this Madras Terrace. So you can see Clive House, which is there now still in the port. It has a Kandikal roof, Fort Museum, Fort Exchange. Later became the Bank of Madras. Now it's the Fort Museum. In the interior of Fort St. George, North Street. This is all White Town. You can see it's quite distinct from Black Town. Now slowly, this is Fort Square. And St. Mary's Church. It's worth describing St. Mary's Church 
because it was the only bomb proof building in the port on account of a bomb proof roof that was approximately 4 feet thick and rounded in the manner of a wagon's roof so if you go there you'll find that it's a rounded roof so as to call cannon balls to ricochet the internal dimensions of the building are 86 feet by 56 feet and the outside walls are 4 feet thick can you imagine practically half the width of this and uh, the walls separating the leaf from the aisle are, are 3 feet thick so the extraordinary thickness of the walls was to protect the building from attack and damage during storms this was a big problem and this is what also destroyed the environment of madras because the british in order to see the french troops coming in they completely cut down all the trees between fort st george and mylapore so that the french could not hide behind the tree normally the soldiers i suppose in those days hid behind the tree and slowly came up by cutting down all the trees so you know the uh, deforestation the environmental degradation really began in these uh, british french wars so this is uh, also from the macnab collection it was the residence for the governors of madras before what is now raj bhavan was built now here you see that this is a european house but this comes into black town slowly the europeans moved out of white town out of the fort and started living in black town and they started building houses and here you see a street where one side is indian and one side is british so i think this tells you a lot about racial discrimination whatever they may say about not having it this is definitely there now were there castles in madras there were and this painting from the british library describes the ca ca castles in madras two neo gothic castellated houses with a third house in the center in the background the house was built by james brodie a east india company servant who was granted 11 acres of land just a small employee on quibble island in the estuary of the adya river again destroying our environment brodie's castle was an imposing structure flanked by these castellated turrets set on either side of the main house so you actually had castles in madras brodie's castle fort st george assembly building this also had that castle castle effect then of course we come to this is a very important architectural style the palladian style palladian architecture is a european style derived from and inspired by the designs of the venetian architect andrea palladio who lived between 1508 and 1580 palladio's work was strongly based on the symmetry perspective and values of the former classical temple architecture of the ancient greeks and romans such as the temple of zeus in olympia greece and the temple of jupiter optimus maximus in rome from the 17th century palladio's interpretation was adapted into a style known as palladianism and it continued to develop until the end of the 18th century so this is a palladian style house in madras and you find that most of the houses are palladian at least all the government the thing you will find they have the big triangle with pillars in front very imposing very romanesque this was government house it was the home of successive governors it was purchased by the east india company from a portuguese lady this is antonia da madeiros and one of the theories for the name of madras is that it comes from the lady the madra madras family but i don't agree because the original uh, document which the british signed with uh, which francis day signed with uh, venkatapati nayakar 
says the land south of the village of madrasa pattinam so madrasa pattinam is actually the original village which was north of the fort st george so i don't agree with this theory but i may as well share it with you and this is what is today rajaji hall so this is also part of that typical palladian architecture this was the original club madras club we have the former president sitting here mr nagarajan madras club which was uh, first situated off mount road between white's road and general patters road on property that was bought from for 30000 rupees and later it became the indian express estate and then it was pulled down and today it's express avenue shopping mall so st george's cathedral is it beautiful can you imagine cathedral road like this it and it has carriages arriving at the door this was a site known called the chowtri plain which is now cathedral road and it was designed by colonel colwell a senior engineer of the british east india company and it occupies an important place in the history of christianity in india as the church of south india was inaugurated here in 1947 after the british left st andrew's kirk was a scottish equivalent and although the uh, english and the scots lived together worked together they led separate lives they did not they had their own churches and one would not attend the church of the other this is in the interior of st andrew's church it's worth going and seeing it's a very beautiful building then we come of course to indo saraceni it's a synthesis of hindu muslim gothic revival styles using indian material but developed by british architects in india during the late 19th and early 20th century so it combines goth gothic arches domes spire you've all seen it you know what it is chepak palace designed by paul medenti is said to be the first indo saracenic building in india now is was the indo saracenic style a conscious attempt by the british to show that they belong to the country i wonder any case this is the first indo saracenic building of madras the whole indo saracenic style remember started in madras today you see it all over the country but madras was its birthplace it's the official residence of the nawab of our court this is the kalas mahal and the humayun mahal it was designed by paul benfield in 1768 These are the architects the Indo-Saracenic architects Robert Fellows Chisholm Henry Irwin Charles Mant William Emerson George Whitted Frederick Stevens and you have these onion onion domes the miniature domes the dome chhatri so what are the typical signs of Indo-Saracenic art overhanging architecture sorry overhanging eaves pointed cast or scalloped arches pinnacles towers minarets even harem windows <laughs> pavilions open pavilions with bangla roofs pierced open arcades vaulted roofs madras terrace ceilings all of them have madras terrace ceiling and then you have walls of relief plaster some were decorated and painted and if you go to a place like uh, the chepak palace you will see a lot of plaster work on the wall stained glass windows stone flooring arcaded veranda all this was typical the construction material red brick painted with lime mortar so this was the uh, indo saracenic architecture which is really a legacy of the indo british combination which we which is left to us konamara library this is a very beautiful building and if you have not been there please go in and see it madras central station 
very typically Indo-Sarasenic. Then this is the Presidency College, actually this is a plain view, plano, but uh, of course flat. The Bharat Insurance Building on Mount Road, you must have seen this. Mr. Muttaya worked very hard to prevent it from being pulled down. Senate House, Madras High Court, Moor Market. That's when I first met Mr. Muttaya. We fought and we really fought for Moor Market and then it was very conveniently it burnt down. A lot of convenient things happened in Madras also. Spencer's. I think most of us if you belong to Madras, my happiest memories of my childhood were being taken by my grandfather in the evening, eating cake at Spencer's. And it was, it was, it was really another world. And of course, Ice House, that's also got in Indo-Saracenic. And the, another final style is Art Deco, Deco, which first appeared in France after the First World War and became popular in the 20s, 30s and 40s. It's a very eclectic style that combines traditional motifs with modern imagery and materials. It looked very modern. It has rich colors, geometrical shapes and ornamentation. And many buildings were built like it. There are no external verandas and it incorporated new technologies such as the lift, the elevator, cantilever, Cantilever came in for the first time in Art Deco and it had motives which were used in grills. Previously grills were just straight, uh, parallel jail bar. Now they had elaborate motives and parapet walls along with vertical windows. And it was described in assertive, as an assertively modern style that ran to symmetry rather than asymmetry and to the rectilinear rather than the curvilinear. Till now, till Indo-Saracenic, they were all very curvilinear. Now they are very rectilinear. It responded to the demands of the machine and of new materials and the requirement of mass production. In fact, a lot of multi-story buildings came up in this time. So you have Higginbotham, which is an art decor building, their house, Harriet Company, Mint Clock Tower, Dasaprakash Hotel, another which has gone, the best Masal Dosha in Madras, Casino Theatre, also gone there. And finally we come to bungalows of Madras, which are developed from the Bengali Bangla. And the English adapted it to their needs by designing it with wide covered verandas, an open floor plan. I mean, think of your uh, village houses. That is a typical Indian house, you know, which is closed. But now it was open and it was a uh, lot of, there was a lot of cross ventilation and protection from the hot, dusty Indian climate. But it also incorporated things like the Nadu Mittam and so, uh, the, uh, different Indian systems. It had a low pitched roof. And the entry generally opens directly into the living room. Now that was never done in a traditional Indian house. You always had a thin eye and you went in. And, but here you went straight into the living room. A large front porch, then, which became an outdoor covered space. And there were a lot of verandas, porches and patios, which gave a lot of, um, what shall I call it, a lot of, Air came in, cross ventilation, and so on. And movement came in from room to room. The passage, which is typical of uh, South Indian homes, was eliminated. So here you have Madras Club, but it was actually the home of George Mowbray in the 18th century. These are all sketches from Kalamkriya, Ben's Garden. Marble Hall in Luz, Beach House of Mr. Subramanian, Harati Lam. This is our own building over here. Anyone who is interested, please come and see it. The Siti Ramaswamy Ayer Foundation. 
and uh, so I'll just uh, no no I'm going wrong way. Okay, Bharati Illam has, although it is a Bangla, it also has a lot of the traditional Indian motifs remain. And uh, Mithila also you can see is more Indian in appearance, although it is a Bangla. So colonial architecture was a synthesis and confluence of styles which gave new dimensions to the planning of building. The size of the rooms increased substantially and I think all of you would have noticed that in many of the homes of Madras. Indian rooms were much smaller than their European counterparts. New concepts of dining rooms, ballrooms, etc. were a colonial influence. The bungalows became English country houses adapted to the Indian climate. The building shows separation of spaces, such as the gates and barriers, which in a traditional house was part of the main building. The approach, height and size were expressions of colonial power. You know, one thing about these bungalows where these Englishmen lived, they also wanted to show that, you know, we are the ruling power. They were making a statement. You know, it wasn't just one more house. So, the, this building, I think, originally belonged to Justice Morton, not at our uh, foundation building. So, you know, they all built it in that, uh, with that idea. And of course, the planning took into account the climate. The walls were thick and almost all the buildings have a veranda. The last is actually Chetinad Palace. It's one of the few Chetinad Few palaces built outside Chetina and it was built between 1902 and 12. It's an exquisite construction of Italian marble, limestone and tea. But it's really a one-off thing. You don't have anything like this before or after. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of Madras's heritage building. If you drive down C.P. Rabaswami Ayya Road or TTK Road, you will find buildings broken down every day. Many of these buildings have already been demolished or conveniently burnt. Unfortunately, there is no Heritage Act that will protect heritage buildings in Tamil Nadu. Bombay, Goa, many cities have it. We tried very hard, Mr. Muttaya really worked for a Heritage Act. But you know, the city fathers were definitely against it. So what is the future for Madras's unique and eclectic architecture? God knows. I'd like to thank Dr. Balaji, he's here, Assistant Professor at the CPR Institute of Indological Research, Mr. V. Narayan Swami, who has a fabulous collection of paintings of old Madras, Mrs. Chandra Shankar, who published Kalam Kriya, the British Library, where I collected a lot of paintings, the Hindu, Roli books, and of course, good old Wikipedia, who always has enough pictures which we can take. I'd like to thank Colors of Glory again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Krishna took us to a journey of Madras from 1915-16. If a generation like me and sitting behind youngsters, thinking was Madras like this, and the slides and the picture was so catching up. You can imagine, just could have been there, if you go to Fort St. George and you climb up on the track, it gives the same feeling today also. So he brought us how the Portuguese came, then the Dutch came and the British came, and how the Fort St. George, the four inch thick wall, I can support you on the statement because I had an office there for four years. No wall in any building is less than two, two feet at least, and you can't innovate them today. You can only paint them, that's all. This, uh, this one part. Well, ma'am, you said the, the Madras the celebration. Yes. I think it is one event. People come and you very nicely said the gentle husband can throw surprise anytime. As you mentioned here. So, people do come in this event. I saw it when I joined, came to Chennai. And it is the one event of pride for anybody in China, Madras to be part of celebration. The best part I like uh, in this talk for all of us, 
that you are relating and we were going down the memory lane what was and what is there like expenses you have been you have been here that time and we saw today's building you correlate and you can say oh this is gone there are some buildings here like your uh, magmur uh, museum is there fort st george is there i have been on the building of four years you feel sometime why nobody is looking after the, the heritage part yes can be done well madras club i am happy to the chairman is here and of course the last to finish is the das prakash the dosas with chennai dosa you go to delhi this is you don't ask you chennai how the do chennai dosa is very good it's very nice you connect it from building to food a very fascinating talk to doctor nanda krishna have i have no much words but i'll say big word for everybody to thank you for such a fascinating talk supporting with your slides and making us connect with the architecture the the history as well as some links why madras day is so so day probably i didn't know about it and you linked it so well thank you so much i may request uh, dr ramchandran to give a small uh, token of the colors of glory dr nayita krishna thank you ladies and gentlemen i like to thank all the distinguished guests who are present here veterans of ranging from 1962 to 71 until today and of course fathers of many young young soldiers sitting here thank you so much for gracing this evening and being part of this uh, uh talk the fourth edition of mr butayas memorial and we are part of armed forces veteran officers association we call it short afpoa the acronym i'll also like to thank all the guests in the audience who are attending our for the first time very thankful to you for sparing your time and we'll also feel so happy that you're joining us as member we lunch much more talk like this like dr krishna gave us today connect back to our heritage which is military heritage the civil heritage go together in nation a good a good point i also like to thank the members of madras uh, book club and the madras literary society who are attending us today first time i would like you to see join much more to us on our events now we have be happy i will feeling my duty i don't uh, thank kanal sundar and uh, his good lady who has always been uh, taking uh, shouldering the responsibilities thank you so much and i will be forgetting if i don't thank young danish who is hiding yeah and his friends from guruna college who are doing a volunteer's job thank you so much god bless you all thank you so much <laughs> and i will be also for failing if i don't thank mr srinivasan and his team from the center who made us this hall available and all the support thank you so much and last but not the least the team of the studio who are giving the photograph and video coverage to us thank you so much so that we look back not only the slides who all were there joined us today and many more come next time thank you so much at the end i'll thank all of you once again you spared your evening came here we met yes but what a fascinating talk we get to listen and learn from here thank you so much all of you jai hind